All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lee Arnold, and welcome to He's the Solution Ministries. Glad to have you all here with us this morning. Uh, as we continue our study in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you would please open up your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now, the little subheading in my Bible says a time for everything, but uh, I've titled this passage, God's Perfect Timing, uh, even when we don't think it is, it is. So let's begin, we'll read together uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning verse 1, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, and a time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? Verse 10, I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in his time. And he's also set eternity in our heart, in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to, to do good if, while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever is has already been and whatever what will be has been before. And God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun in the place of judgment. Wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. And I thought in my heart, God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked, and there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. I also thought, as for men, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. The man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place, all come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. So I saw that there's nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you this morning as we open up your word, Lord, as we... Uh, Lord, as we contemplate these words from Solomon, Lord, a man who, as of this writing, is backslidden and really discouraged in what he's discovered in his years on this planet, and Lord, finding it to be empty and, and without joy and meaningless, without purpose. And Lord, I know that so many people get up every day going through the same old routine and just the monotony and the mundaneness of life. And Lord, many are discouraged and, and just tired of the same old, same old and wondering what it's all about. Lord, I pray this morning that you would just speak to each one of us and remind us why it is you have us here and what it is you want us to accomplish and, and what your purpose and your will is. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts to be receptive. Lord, I pray that you would help me to get out of the way. Lord, nobody cares what I have to say, Lord. We want to hear from you. And so, Lord, we just come here now with hearts opened and ears opened, excited to hear what it is you would have to share with us. So, Lord, speak to each one. You know the needs this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Now, if you are like most people, uh, when they read this passage of scripture, they think of the famous song uh, sung by the birds uh, recorded in 1965. 
Uh, you remember the song, Turn, Turn, Turn. To everything, there's a season. This is a song written by Pete Seeger in the late 1950s and first recorded in 1959. The lyrics, except for the title, which is repeated throughout the song in the final two lines, consist of the first eight verses of the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. The song became an international hit in late 1965 when it was adapted by the American folk group, The Birds. The single entered the U.S. chart at number 80 on October 23rd, 1965, and before reaching number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart on December 4th, 1965. Now, some of you joining us here, you remember when that song first came out because you were alive in 65. In Canada, it reached number three on the November 29th, uh, 1965, and also peaked at number 26 on the UK singles chart. It is the single most successful pop song in our culture with the oldest lyrics written over 3,000 years ago by King Solomon. I never thought about it like that. The most popular pop song in history written over 3,000 years ago. However, contrary to popular opinion, this section of scripture set to music in the 60s is not speaking poetically of the cycles or the seasons of life in a romanticized way. Rather, in his journey to find happiness and in his attempt to grasp meaning, Solomon is saying, life is predictable, life is mundane, and life is boring. What you sow is eventually what you reap, and what you build eventually falls apart, and what you love eventually dies, but it's followed by hate. You have peace, but soon there will be war. Everything is futile, mundane, and predictable. So we have to read these verses a little bit differently than the famous pop song causes us to sing them. And admittedly, it's a song that I've known for many years, a song that I, I love. I think it's a great tune. It's, it's positive. It's upbeat. But that is not the way Solomon was writing these words. Now, if we were to modernize the words, it would say something like this. There's a time to be rich, a time to be poor. There's a time to experience cancer, and there's a time to experience remission. There's a time to experience marriage, and there's a time to experience divorce. There's a time to experience and celebrate life, and there's a time for death. There's a time when our kids will be at home and young and uh, filling our days with laughter. And there will be a time when our kids are not walking with the Lord, going down the wrong path. That would be our version of Solomon's song. Truth. It has been said that the problem with life is that it's so daily. <laughs> And that's what Solomon is saying when he says there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more. Now, it gives us a glimmer of hope in verse 11, which says he's made everything beautiful in his time. Now, the thing that we have to remember as we're reading through Ecclesiastes is that we are reading from a man who was once walking very closely with the Lord. The Lord blessed him abundantly. Uh, the greatest blessing of abundance that has ever been seen in the history of the world. And as we've seen from other chapters, chapters two, one and chapter two, Solomon got bored. Solomon stopped walking with the Lord. Solomon started looking at the things the earth could provide. He says, everything my eyes wanted, I did not prohibit. Anything I saw and wanted it, I got it. And as we read through Ecclesiastes, he's discovering that life on this planet is not all it's cracked up to be. And if all we have is life on this planet, then life sucks. That's pretty much what he's saying. So these are the words of a backslidden Christian. And we got to keep that in mind as we're reading through them, because if we don't, we will lose the context of them. Uh, and as I was reading uh, verse 4, you know, time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. You know, I'm seeing Kevin Bacon uh, in the movie Footloose, you know, in front of the school board saying, hey, even Solomon said there was a time to dance. <laughs> 
And as we look at this, we're, we realize, you know, this was not Solomon saying you should dance. He's saying, you know, you're going to dance. Sometimes you're going to dance. Sometimes you're not. But he was not, this was not celebratory. This was not Solomon excited about life. This is Solomon, basically the drudgery of life, a time to be born, time to die, time to plant and time to whack the plants down and time to kill and time to hill. That's just where he's at. That's his state of mind as he's writing this. Now, previously, Solomon had given his heart to the Lord, but presently, because of the influence of thousands of wives and concubines, because of his hoarding of silver and gold that was expressly forbidden in Deuteronomy 17, because of his disobedience to the Lord, he is now in a backslidden state. So the truth and understanding in the back of his mind, he knows the truth, yet he's not living it, walking it, or experiencing it. Now, I can tell you personally that for me, I went through a period of my life where I was in a backslidden state and I was chasing dollars and getting rich was my biggest priority. And I didn't really care about anything else. Now, I, you know, I put on a very nice facade and I was at church every Sunday and, you know, Wednesday night Bible study. And I, I was always really good at playing Christian. But during this season in my life, I was only playing Christian because my focus was on getting rich. And the more you had, the more successful you were, uh, the more accolades, the more uh, celebrity, you know, these things were important to me. And in 2008-9, God took all those things away, and he made me realize that those things aren't important. They are meaningless. And if that's what you're going to spend your days chasing and pursuing, you're going to come to the end of your life and realize that it was all for naught, you know? And we have read stories from throughout history of people who spent their entire life trying to earn and to gain only to lose it all or to give it back to kids that aren't going to do anything better with it. We talked about that, about that last week. Uh, verse 26 of verse chapter 2 says, To the man who pleases God, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So chapter 3 is a continuation of this. Solomon is just in this state of despair and despondency. He just is kind of just done. And you know, I don't know about you, but I've been there. I have found myself in that, that place of just being done. I wasn't happy at my job. I wasn't happy in my relationships. I wasn't happy at home. I wasn't happy at work. I just felt like, what's, what's it all about? And if you find yourself in that position, if you find yourself feeling that way, I can tell you for me, it was because I realized that none of my efforts, none of my uh, focus had anything to do with what the Lord's will was for me, with what the Lord wanted me to be doing. And I found life to be empty and meaningless and monotonous and boring because I wasn't building anything that had an eternal value. I was only building things that had a monetary value. And while that's fun for a time and a season, you get to a place where you just go, there's got to be more. You know, my life cannot just be about getting up in the morning and making money and eating and going to bed and amassing wealth only to have it lost. It's got to be more. If you find yourself feeling a little discouraged this morning, I would ask, is your life being used for the Lord's work? Are you utilizing the days that you're given by the Lord for ministry? Are you using it to serve? Are you using it to be a blessing to other people? Or do you get up every morning with the mentality and the focus of, okay, I got to go make something. I got to go build something. I got to go earn something. I've got to go sell something. Is every day about survival or is every day about an opportunity to serve Christ and to be a blessing to others? 
Because, well, I'll tell you this, if it's if you're not getting up in the morning and saying, Lord, who can I pray for this morning? Lord, who can I serve this morning? Who can I make a positive difference for this morning? And you spend the rest of your day looking for God's direction. You spend the rest of your day looking for God's appointments. You know, and you're at the grocery store and you're talking to the, the checker who's saying the day's not going great and there's some challenges and some struggles. And you say, wow, can I pray with you right now? And you pray with that person. Now, some of you might not feel comfortable doing that. And that sounds odd. Well, as, as you make your life more and more about pleasing the Lord and honoring the Lord and doing what he would have you to be doing, then those things aren't so strange because we don't see them as us praying for, you know, some strange person at the grocery store. We see it as God appointing us to be in that grocery store in that very moment, at that very lane, with that very checker, because that checker this morning was praying to the Lord that he would, if he was real, that he would just reveal himself in some way. And God places you in that grocery store line to pray with that person. So while you are being used by God, that person is getting their prayers answered. What Solomon is saying in verses 1 through 8 is he's saying timing is important. All the experience listed in these verses are appropriate at certain times. The secret to peace with God is to discover, accept, and appreciate God's perfect timing. The danger is to doubt or resent God's timing. This can lead to despair, rebellion, or moving ahead without his advice. And I thought about that. I thought, man, how guilty am I of moving ahead of God's timing? Or pounding my fist on the table and saying, God, I've been praying about this now for like five years, and you still haven't given it to me. What's going on, God? And we question God's timing. And we look at the check balance book and we look at the stack of bills and we say, God, why haven't you blessed me abundantly? Why am I still struggling to pay these bills, God? I have been praying that you would give me abundance. I've been praying that you would help me to get out of the rat race and that you would allow me to build a business and be an entrepreneur, a successful one. And God, that hasn't happened yet. And I'm angry. Well, the fact that it hasn't happened yet simply means it's not God's time yet. And we don't want to doubt or resent God's timing, nor do we want to question God's timing. We don't want to race into something simply because we feel like we need it, only to discover that it is not what God wanted for us. You know, how often have we met people that raced into a relationship and raced into a marriage only six months or six years or 60 years later to discover that that wasn't God's timing. If we stay in God's timing, life isn't going to be easy and it's not going to be all rainbows and roses, but it's going to be a lot more peaceful. You know, I would much rather be struggling financially in God's timing than rich outside of God's timing. I would rather be ill in God's timing than well out of God's timing. God's timing is so important. And if we doubt it or question it, we can become despondent or rebellious or impatient. And for me, the big one is impatience. I am the most impatient person on the planet. I want everything like now. I am a microwave generation guy. You know, and if it's not done in 90 seconds or less, I'm tapping my fingers and, you know, tapping my feet. And, Come on, let's move, let's move, let's move. It's hard for me to wait. I don't like the waiting. But even God has a purpose for the waiting. A time to love, a time to hate, verse 8, a time for war, a time for peace. Question is, when is there a time for hating? Are we as Christians called to hate? Well, we should not hate evil people, but we should hate what they do. 
We should also hate it when people are mistreated, when children are starving, and when God is being dishonored. In addition, we must hate sin in our lives. This is God's attitude. So yes, there are things we should hate. Love the sinner, hate the sin. So yes, there is a time to hate. What's going on in our government, in our schools, such ungodly decisions being made. As it relates to abortion, you know, several states now passing late term abortion as law. We should hate that. We should absolutely hate that. God being taken out of our schools, we should hate that. God being taken out of our courts, the Ten Commandments not being able to be displayed in our courtrooms, we should hate that. You know, we, we look around and we wonder, why, what's going on in our world? Why the hate? Why the mass shootings? Another one, last week at a grocery store. Why? Because we have told everyone in the, in the country, ah, there's no rules. No, 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 there's no Ten Commandments. Nope, you can't talk about them. Yep, if you mention them in school, this is a public place. Don't mention the Ten Commandments. Well, if there's no laws, if there's no rules, then what exactly is it we're supposed to follow? Well, decent human behavior. Okay, but if if my life is, you know, from birth to death and that's it, then you're not my mother. You're not my father. I don't have to answer to you. So I'm going to go do whatever I want because it feels good. And there's nothing you can do about it. So go pound sand. By taking God out of everything, schools, courts, we're basically telling every future generation, God doesn't exist. You know, we have adults, we have scientists, we have some of the smartest minds, supposedly, to have ever lived telling us that God doesn't exist, that we are the product of a big bang, that we are ooze and goos. And we wonder why our kids are struggling with mental challenges and suicide is at the highest level it's ever been and kids are questioning their sexuality. Why is this happening? It's because we as Christians have allowed our politicians to pass these silly laws and for schools to take out Ten Commandments and to eliminate God and we have fallen asleep at the wheel, and we should hate that. And there should be a war from the Christian community on that. We should be upset and irate and out there politicking and campaigning to do something about it. But admittedly, I, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody by saying, man, I wish somebody would do something about that. <laughs> and every time I have that thought, every time I think that, that song on Christian radio comes into my mind. God, why don't you do something? And the chorus is, I did. I created you. If not now, then when? If not who? If not how, then who? Uh, I'm trying to think of the lyrics. Just a great song. I think it's Toby Mac. You guys should check it out. If not, uh, if not, yeah, you guys can look it up. Great song. And it convicts me every time I hear it. Verse 9. So what does the worker gain from his toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on men. Your ability to find satisfaction in your work just depends to a large extent on your attitude. You will become dissatisfied if you lose the sense of purpose God intended for your work. You can enjoy your work if, number one, you remember that God has given us work to do. That job that you have, that's, that's from the Lord. Realize that the fruit of our labor is a gift from him and see your work as a way to serve God. You know, if you are unhappy in your job, are you utilizing your job as ministry? Every day, God surrounds you with people at your office that do not know him, that are not walking with him, that do not have a relationship with him. Are you using the access that you have from your work to witness to those people? 
Well, Lee, I can't at work. They'll fire me. Good. That'd be fantastic. You know, when friends and family ask, okay, what happened to your job? Well, I was sharing Christ with a coworker and they fired me. <laughs> I mean, that's a great testimony. But Lee, what about, you know, if I get fired, then you know, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. And, the, you know, I've got, I got kids and I got responsibilities. I got this. You know what? I, I understand all of that. But I believe that our greatest responsibility in this life is to preach Christ and to share him with others. And the consequences and the fallout from that, I believe that the Lord will bless us and reward us as a result of being so bold. And the Christian community needs to stop letting political correctness dictate our boldness. If you are disenchanted at your work, it's because you are not exercising the very thing that God created you to do. And that is to share and witness and love and pray with and for others and share Christ. So you want to find joy in your work again? Figure out how to make your job your ministry. Figure out how to make your ministry, your, your business, your ministry. You know, put some Bible verses on your email when you send it out. Just make it part of your email. That's just the stock email. That verse goes out in every email that you send. Let it be known that your business is a Christian business. Let it be known. That if you want to talk with me at the office, I'm going to share Christ. We've got to be bold. Verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Many newer translations correctly read, he has set eternity in their heart. Verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Every person understands innately and intuitively that he is an eternal creature. While he or she may suppress that knowledge instinctively, they know that eternity is in their heart, that there is more to life than what he sees. God has set eternity in people's hearts. This means that we can never be completely satisfied with earthly pleasures and pursuits because we are created in God's image, which means we should have a spiritual thirst. We have an eternal value and nothing but the eternal God can truly satisfy us. He has built us in a restless yearning for the kind of perfect world that can only be found in his perfect rule. He has given us a glimpse of the perfection of his creation, but it is only a glimpse. We cannot see into the future or comprehend everything. So we must trust him now and do his work on earth. So here Solomon is affirming that God is at work in our individual lives, seeking to accomplish his will. All of these events come from God and they are good in his time. The inference is plain. If we cooperate with God's timing, life will be meaningless. Everything will be beautiful in his time. Even the most difficult experiences of life. You know, that made me think of that song, In His Time, uh, Marantha Music. The lyrics are these, in his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time. Second verse, Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time. Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. In God's timing, everything is beautiful. Outside of God's timing, everything is challenging and difficult and frustrating. And again, when you are feeling frustrated, that needs to just kind of be a, a temperature check, a, a, an early warning sign that you are trying to get ahead of the Lord, to get in front of him. 
And we need to make sure that we're not doing that. We need to make sure that we are patiently waiting in his time. Now, we have to be very careful here because I think that there's a very big difference between patience and complacency. Patience is waiting at the door, knocking, okay, Lord, I'm ready to go. Lord, I'm ready to go. Whenever you want me to go, just open the door. Lord, I'm ready. Open the door. Okay, that's patiently waiting. Complacency is, I've been standing at the door for so long, Lord, I'm going to go sit on the couch, I'm going to watch some TV, eat some chips, and um, Lord, when you decide to open that door, you know, I'll, I will at that point check my level of enthusiasm and um, see where we stand at that point. Okay, complacency. Complacency is where we have settled into and accepted the drudgery. Yeah, you know, I guess it's just my fate. I guess this is just what the Lord has for me. I guess it's going to be joyless and painful and, you know, woe is me. And I don't even know why I get out of bed in the morning because life is always the same. And But I guess that's just my lot. So I guess I'll just bear it. No. The Lord wants great things. He wants to use you to do great things. And if you have slipped into a, a, a routine of complacency and drudgery, because you just don't feel like you're ever going to get ahead. You can't get ahead. You've been trying. You've been spinning your wheels. You've been trying this and trying that. And you feel like you've knocked on a million doors and God hasn't opened any of them. And you're going, Lord, what's the problem? I've been to this seminar, I've been to this training, I've been to that workshop, I've been to this thing, I went to that guru, I went to this guy, and I'm not rich yet, so Lord, what's the problem? And we get despondent, and we get angry, and we get upset, and so we go up and we start trying to, to push a bad deal. Now, I see this so often in our business, uh, for those of you that don't know, we have a real estate investment education company and we teach people how to find real estate investment opportunities. And then we have a private lending arm that will lend money to these people. And, you know, we have a, we are blessed to have a lot of people that know the Lord and are walking with the Lord, and, uh, love Jesus. And because we're the lender, I see a lot of these deals coming through. And I look at these deals and I think, why are we doing this? This is not a good deal. Well, Lee, I, you know, I've been looking, you know, I've been looking for six months and this is the only one that God's brought me. So it must be the one that God wants me to have. And I'm looking at it and going, I can assure you that this is not the deal that God wants you to have. Unless you feel like God wants you to teach you a lesson on losing money, then if that's right, then yeah, that's the deal. But this is not the deal. And they will fight me on this. And they'll say, no, I've, I've worked too hard. I've spent too much money. I've got more money invested in this thing than I ever thought. And I need to get some money back or, or I'm going to be in big trouble. And I'm thinking, well, if you do this deal, you're going to be in bigger trouble. So have you prayed over this deal? Have you, have you asked the Lord? Have you said, Lord, is this the deal? When you sit down at your office in the morning, do you, do you pray and say, Lord, if, if it would be your will, Lord, help me to find the right deal this morning. Lord, if it be your will, point me in the right direction of somebody that needs to borrow some money so I can broker a loan. Lord, if it would be your will. Have we surrendered and submitted entirely to his authority? And are we willing to accept whatever the outcome of that prayer is. You know, it's like the child that asks for candy. Dad, can I have candy? No. Well, okay, could I have a chocolate bar? No. Could I have a sucker? No. Could I have a Pop-Tart? No. Could I have a cookie? No. It's all candy, it's all sugar. I, I'm saying no, because I don't want you to have sugar. That's what I don't want you to have. But we, we, you know, we keep, we keep asking, we keep asking, we keep asking, and we say, Lord, if it would be your will, could I please have some candy? 
And if the Lord says no, then we go, okay, well, that's all right, Lord, I'm fine with that. Lord, if I can't have candy, show me what it is you would like for me to have. Lord, if you're not going to give me a deal, then maybe real estate investing is not the direction you want me to go. Maybe private money brokering is not the direction you want me to go. Lord, perhaps being an entrepreneur is not the direction you have for me to go. So Lord, if you're not going to bring me a deal, I'm fine with that, but I want to be effective for you, Lord. So point me in the direction that you would have me to go. Have you ever considered that perhaps the Lord has not allowed you to be successful in the thing that you've been attempting to be successful in because he doesn't want you to go that direction? He wants you to stay at your job. Well, Lee, that can't be right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't want me at this job. I hate this job. Well, you hate that job because you haven't figured out how to make that job your ministry. And God is not going to give you success in some other path when you've got a co-worker that, that's been praying, that is desperately seeking the Lord, and the Lord wants to use you to witness to them. He's not going to give you success because he needs you in that job to save that life, to share him with that person. See, we have got to open up our eyes, not to our checkbook balance or the 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 world around us financially as it relates to me personally we need to think bigger we need to think eternally okay the bible says not to store up treasures for ourselves on earth where moth or rust can destroy so god did not put you on this planet at this moment in history because he needs you to get rich he puts you on this planet at this moment in history because he needs you to share him with others the only effort you will see in heaven are the souls that you witnessed to while you were here on earth. You will not see your bank balance. You will not see your cars. You will not see your houses. You will not see your investments. You will not see your cash flow. You will not see your 401k balance. You will not see your self-directed IRA. All of those things are worldly under the sun things. Now, that doesn't mean that they're bad things. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to have success at some point, but it's got to be in his time. So your prayer might look something like this, Lord, I feel like I've been working very hard to be successful in real estate or being an entrepreneur or starting this company. But Lord, you have not opened that door. I've not seen success from that. So Lord, I, I trust you. And I, I, I just have to assume, Lord, that there's a reason. I don't have to assume, Lord, I know there's a reason. But Lord, I pray that you would reveal the reason to me. And Lord, help me to accomplish those things you need me to do first. So that when in your time, you are ready for me to be successful in that business or that venture, that I can give you my all. Verse 12, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. To rejoice and to do good while we live are worthy goals for life. But we can pursue them the wrong way. God wants us to enjoy life when we have the proper view of God. We discover that real pleasure is found in enjoying whatever we have as gifts from God, not in what we accumulate. Do you sense the struggle in the soul of Solomon? He says, I know there is eternity in the hearts of men, and yet why not just enjoy what's right before us? The labor, the food, the drink. Verse 14. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. I'm so thankful that what God does cannot be changed by us. I have a tendency to think I can add to my righteousness if I pray especially hard or study the word longer than I ever have previously. If I read 10 chapters tomorrow, God will really be happy with me. Not so. There's not a single thing we can do to add 
to what he has already done for us in declaring us righteous. Conversely, we think that because we kicked the dog, lost our temper, or forgot to pray, certainly something has been lost in our standing with the Lord. Again, not true. Jesus meant what he said when he declared, it is finished, and I'm so glad. God doesn't have any expectations from you outside of walking with him, following him, praying to him, living for him, serving him. But he's not up in heaven checking boxes and making sure that you, you know, completed this and you did that. You, you, you went there and you went on a two-year mission and you, you tithed faithfully and you did good works. God's not checking boxes. When you accepted him as Lord and Savior and invited him to your heart, it's finished. As Jesus is hanging on the cross about to breathe his last, he says, it is finished. The work is finished. Now we have the opportunity to share Christ. You want to have more joy in your work? You want to have more joy in your business? You want to have more joy in your family? Preach Christ. Serve Christ. And I want to be very careful there because some of you here preach Christ and you think, well, I'm not a preacher. Some of you, I'm not a speaker. I'm not an ordained pastor. I'm not a this, I'm not a that. When I say preach Christ, it simply means serve him in any capacity that you can. Go clean the church where you don't have to talk to anybody. You're not seen by anybody. God sees that. So as I'm reading through this, the thought that came to my mind, okay, well, Solomon, if all of what you're saying is true, or at least how you feel in your worldly backslidden state, my thought was, what then is the purpose of life? It is that we should fear the all-powerful God. And to fear means to report and to stand in awe of him because of who he is. Purpose in life starts with whom we know, not what we know or how good we are. Purpose in life starts with whom we know. It is impossible to fulfill your God-given purpose unless you fear God and give him first place in your life. You know, what would your life look like right now? What would your family look like right now if you spent as much time pursuing God as you have spent pursuing your career? Think about that. Because that consumes us, you know, in our 20s, we, we've got to prove ourselves, we've got to, you know, get, get, get the best employers on our resume so we can elevate up so we can ratchet up the chain and we can continually be moving up and getting advances and increases and promotions and raises and, 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 and we, you know, we want more. And in our 30s, we start having kids and we have houses. And now it's about, you know, our kids and soccer schedules and all of these things and, you know, vacations and making sure that our kids have the things that they need. And we're very focused on our kids. And then in our 40s, kids are turning into teenagers. Some of you have kids that are getting married and having kids and you're becoming grandparents. And, you know, when do we... Invest time in the Lord's things. And I just want you to think about that. You know, as you look back over your life, how much of your time has been spent chasing and pursuing income? And how much of it has been spent chasing and pursuing a close relationship with the Lord? And a close relationship for others and the Lord? Now, I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody here, so uh, it's not my goal or my desire to make you feel bad or to feel guilty, but give you a different perspective, because the world says whoever dies with the most toys wins. Solomon is saying that that's been his, that's what he discovered, right? I, I was the wealthiest man on earth. And, and am the wealthiest man that has ever been or will ever be. No one will ever be wealthier than Solomon. And I believe that's true. Because we know from last chapter that there was so much silver 
in Jerusalem when Solomon was king that they viewed it as rocks. Silver had the value of rocks because it was so abundant, people didn't even stop to pick it up. And he's saying, how meaningless, 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 meaningless. And somebody unmuted themselves. If you guys could remute yourself, that would be great. Thanks. Verse 15, whatever is has already been. And what will be has been before. And God will call the past to account. Now, this is a mind-blowing phrase because it gives us insight into the reality and nature of eternity. There is no past. There is no present. There is no future. That's why God declared his name to be I am, not I was and not I will be, but I am in the eternal now. Now, Chuck Smith in his commentary, uh, he wrote something that I thought would be very fitting for uh, all of you Star Wars aficionados. He said this, imagine you were able to ride a ray of light traveling at 186,000 miles per second. In about 1.25 seconds, you would tip your hat to the man on the moon. In about seven minutes, you would put have put on sunscreen for your face as you sailed past the sun. 14 years later, again, traveling at the speed of 186,000 miles per second, 14 years later, you would button your overcoat because you would arrive at the uttermost planet Pluto because it's cold there. And 100,000 years later, you would come to the end of our Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda. Then you would hang a right and return back to Earth. Upon your arrival, you would find that the Earth had progressed 3 million years in your absence. Even though you would have aged less than a single day due to the fact that as you approach the speed of light, time slows down incredibly. <clears throat> now in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, we are told God is light. Now what does that mean? I suggest it means that in heaven, everything is in the present now. There is no past and there is no future. I suggest that it is perhaps what the Apostle Paul was suggesting when he talked about the dead in Christ rising first, 1 Corinthians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Could it be that those who have died and gone to heaven are already experiencing our presence with them now? <laughs> right? Whoa. Wow. That's like deep. Beyond my comprehension. But for you Captain Kirk fans, the original. Maybe you get it. C.S. Lewis said this. We have a strange illusion that mere time cancels sin. I have heard others and I've heard myself recounting cruelties and falsehoods committed in boyhood as if they were no concern of the present speakers and even with laughter. But mere time does nothing either to the fact or to the guilt of sin. The guilt is washed out not by time, but by repentance in the blood of Christ. What C.S. Lewis was saying is time is not what brings you salvation because the sins of the past are still the sins of the present. And if those sins have not been confessed to God, then you are still a sinner. Uh, one commentator gave the analogy of a courtroom. If you robbed a bank 30 years ago and you have never been caught, you are still a bank robber and you can still be tried and prosecuted and thrown in jail. Because 30 years ago, you robbed a bank, something that you are not supposed to do. Conversely, anybody who has sinned, which is everybody, because we are sinners because we sin, we don't sin because we're, we sin because we're sinners. We don't become a sinner because we sin. We are born into sin, thanks to our Adam and Eve. But understand that sin is what keeps us from God. And if you have sinned in the past, and we all have, and have not confessed those sins to God, then you are still a sinner. Now, I'm a sinner, but I'm a sinner saved by grace because my sins of the past have been confessed to God. And I said, Lord, I'm so sorry that I did that. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, help me to never do that again. 
And when I confess those sins to the Lord, they are immediately forgiven as far as the east is from the west. So time does not save you. Time, you know, people think, well, I'm a senior citizen now. Certainly God will accept me into heaven. No, that's not true. Because acceptance into heaven is about acceptance of the Son, S-O-N, the Son of God, Jesus, and acknowledging that his death on the cross and his sacrifice is our forgiveness and our remission and our covering of our sins. And if we don't acknowledge that, if we don't say, Lord, I confess to you that I'm a sinner and I need you. And I want you to come into my heart, Lord, I make you my Lord and Savior. And when we say that prayer, he comes in and he indwells us through the Holy Spirit. And now our life needs to be about more than just pleasing ourselves, making money for ourselves, feeding ourselves, accumulating wealth for ourselves. And it now needs to become about sharing the love of Jesus with anybody and everybody that we can. Verse 16, and I saw something else under the sun in the place of judgment wickedness was there in the place of justice wickedness was there expressing his frustration solomon asks or solomon says as i look around i see corruption politically and inequality spiritually there is wickedness in the place of justice it even affects the legal system solomon asks how god's plan can be perfect when there's so much injustice and and oppression in the world he concluded that God does not ignore injustice, but will bring it to an end at his appointed time. So all of these things, you know, these, these governors, these mayors that are passing these crazy laws, late-term abortion, the, the politicians that are passing those laws, the people that are voting for these politicians that are passing these laws, there is a judgment coming for them at God's appointed time. So yes, we should hate that. And as Christians, we should be rising up against that. And what those people think is that they are winning. You know, the, the, the group that was responsible for getting prayer removed from schools and getting the Ten Commandments removed from schools, they are high-fiving each other for the last 40 years going, we won. <laughs> no, you may have won the battle, but you will lose the war. Because there is a judgment day coming for everyone who denies God and refuses to acknowledge that he is the creator of the universe and that it is through his son and his son's death on the cross that we have forgiveness of sins. And if we do not confess our sins and invite Jesus into our heart, then we too will be judged because we are sinners. And a sinner who has not confessed or repented to God is a sinner that is going to hell. And see, that's another term that you can't use or is not politically correct because nobody wants to acknowledge that hell's a real place and that God is a fair and righteous God. And those who have sinned will be punished eternally in hell. Now, it's not politically correct. It's who wants to hear that message? And I think part of the challenge that we are having as a nation, as a society, is churches have stopped preaching hell. Because hellfire and brimstone preaching got a bad rap in the 70s and the 80s with all the traveling, you know, pastors going around. You're going to hell. Well, it may not be popular and people have stopped preaching, but it's still true. God is a righteous judge. If you have sinned and you do not confess that sin, there will be punishment. But even after we accept Jesus in our heart, doesn't mean we stop sinning. We're still sinners. It's our human nature. It's what we do. It's why dogs bark. It's just what they do. But we have forgiveness and remission of those sins through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So Solomon reflects on several apparent contradictions in God's control in the world. There is wickedness where there should be justice. People created in God's image die just like the animals. No one comforts the oppressed. Many people are motivated by envy. People are lonely. Recognition for accomplishments is temporary. These are all the things that Solomon is highlighting here. And it is easy to see such contradictions as excuses not to believe in God. But 
Solve and use them to show how we can honestly look at life's problems and still keep our faith. This life is not all there is. Yet even in this life, we should not pass judgment on God because we do not know everything. God's plan is for us to live forever with him. So live with eternal value in view. Realizing that all contradictions will one day be cleared up by the creator himself. You know, we can get into all of these really long and, and, and evolved discussions about, you know, whether the ark was real and whether uh, the earth was really flooded, you know, and we get into all these theological debates and arguments. But those theological debates and arguments are meaningless if the person that you're sitting in front of having the debate with is still a sinner who has not confessed Christ, has not invited him in his heart, and is going to go to hell at death. So instead of these theological discussions, and anytime I get into it, or somebody tries to pull me into a theological argument, I'll say, hey, wait, wait, time out. I sense where this is going. So before we go any further, can I ask you a question? Sure. Are you saved? Have you invited Jesus into your heart? Is he your Lord and Savior? Well, that's what I want to talk about. No, 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 no. No, no. Have you invited Jesus into your heart? Is your Lord and Savior. Well, no, but that's what I want to talk about. That's what, let me ask you a question. There's 10 commandments from God. Have you ever stolen anything? Yeah. Okay. You're a sinner. And the Bible says that God will judge sinners unless they confess of their sin to God, they acknowledge his son, Jesus, invite him into his heart and ask to be forgiven for those sins. You are a sinner. So do you really want to talk about Moses or Noah or Jonah and the whale? Or do we want to get our lives right with God first? Because if we spend the next 30 minutes in this theological debate and God comes back and I disappear and, and he takes me up into heaven and you're left sitting here, it's too late for you. So why don't we deal with your salvation first and then I'm happy to have as many theological debates with you as you want, because now I'm no longer debating an enemy, I'm debating a brother in Christ. And to me, you becoming a brother of Christ is far more important than me trying to prove through scripture that Noah's ark was real. Where's your relationship with Christ? That needs to be the focus of the discussion. So Christians, don't get sucked into these theological debates with people who don't know Christ because you are wasting valuable and precious time. Get right to it. Get right to the heart of the matter. Do you know Jesus? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Verse 19, man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. The man has no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. Our bodies can't live forever in their present state. In that sense, humans and animals are alike. But Solomon acknowledged that God has given people the hope of eternity, that we will undergo judgment in the next life, making us different from animals because man has eternity set in his heart. He has a unique purpose in God's overall plan, yet we cannot discover God's purpose for our lives by our own efforts, only through building relationships with him and seeking his guidance. Are you now living as God wants? Do you see life as a gift from him? Every morning that you wake up not dead, that is a gift from God, and it is an acknowledgement that he still has a plan and a purpose and a reason for you to be alive this day. That's encouraging, right? And you know, while, yes, we need to be good stewards of what God has given us, and we need to plan for the future, and we need to, you know, the Bible says that the sluggard starves, and we need to earn, and we need to store up, and we need to be prepared. But at the same time, we need to understand that life is short and we don't have a lot of time here. So what do we want to spend our time doing? Working and earning and amassing and building or loving and serving and, and sharing and worshiping? Verse 20, all go to the same place. All come from dust and to dust all return. 
Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. So I saw that there's nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? At this point in his frustration and backslidden state, Solomon comes to the conclusion that men are no different than animals. Who really knows if there's life after death? Who has authority to speak on these things, Solomon wonders. The answer is Jesus. No guru can speak, no philosopher can teach, no scientist can state with authority where a man's spirit goes when he dies because Jesus alone came from heaven. You see, when you are talking with an existentialist, which is somebody who believes that we are saved through our own self-reliance, Christian existentialists believe that our faith in God is self-reliant, so our salvation is self-reliant and based on our faith. When you're talking with an existentialist or a philosopher, an evolutionist or a scientist, the issue will never be decided on the logic of philosophy or evidence scientifically. And while it is intriguing to discuss philosophical viewpoints, in reality, it always comes down to one issue, Jesus Christ. Keep bringing the dialogue back to Jesus and say, wait a minute. There was a man who stated with absolute certainty and authority that man is an eternal being created in the image of God and will live forever. Therefore, either this man is the Lord and should be worshipped, or he's a lunatic and should be locked up, or he's a liar. The question is not, is there a whale big enough to swallow a man, or can the Genesis account be taken literally? The question always is, what did you do with Jesus? What have you, talking to you right now, person watching, person listening, I'm talking to you, what have you done with Jesus? Have you invited him to your heart? Have you asked him to be the Lord of your life? Or have you treated him like a distant relative that you see occasionally, usually Christmas and Easter, which is next Sunday, by the way? Is he the Lord of your life, or is he a mythical, fictional, historical creature, person, that you are aware of the name, but not familiar with the person. Max Licata said this, a friend of late American jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes asked him why he had taken up the study of Greek at the age of 94. Holmes replied, well, my good sir, it's now or never. When JC Penney was 95 years old, he affirmed my eyesight may be getting weaker, but my vision is increasing. Growing old can be dangerous. The trail is treacherous and the pitfalls are many. One is wise to be prepared. You know, it is coming. It's not like God kept the process a secret. It's not like you are blazing a trail as you grow older. It is not as if no one has ever done it before. Look around you. You have ample opportunity to prepare and ample case studies to consider. If growing old catches you by surprise, don't blame God. You've been given plenty of warning. You've also been giving plenty of advice. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39 says, He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. There are two ways to view life, Jesus is saying, those who protect it or those who pursue it. The wisest are not the ones with the most years in their life, but the most life in their years. There is a rawness and a wonder to life. Pursue it. Hunt for it. Sell out to get it. Don't listen to the whines of those who have settled for a second-rate life and want you to do the same so they won't feel guilt. Your goal is not to live long. It is to live. Time slips, days pass, years fade, and life ends. And what we came to do must be done while there is time. We would think it bizarre for a traveler not to be prepared for the end of the journey. We would pity the poor passenger who never read his itinerary. We would be bewildered by someone who thought the purpose of the trip was the trip. Others, however, are anticipating the destination. I hope you are. 
and I hope you will be ready when you get home. For you, age is no enemy. Age is merely a mile marker, a gentle reminder that home has never been so near. D.L. Moody said, the longest time man has to live has no more proportion to eternity than a drop of dew has to the ocean. If it doesn't count for the kingdom, what's it all even for? Don't get to the end of your career and suddenly at that point decide to start serving Christ. Every day is a gift from the Lord. Use it to bring him the praise and glory that he deserves. Using your time on this earth for anything else, like Solomon discovered, will always leave you wanting more of something else. Solomon calls us to accept life, enjoy it a day at a time, and be satisfied. But we must never be satisfied with ourselves. We must be satisfied with what God gives to us in this life. If we grow in character and godliness, and if we live by faith, then we will be able to say with Paul, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you this morning. Lord, grateful for this reminder that life is fleeting. Life is short. But Lord, even in the small window of time that you give us here on this planet, Lord, you've given us, number one, time to come to know you and accept you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray right now for anyone who is watching or listening who has not utilized their time to accept you and invite you into their heart this morning. And Lord, we know that through our study this morning that all things happen in your time. And Lord, there is a reason that every single person watching and listening right now is watching and listening in this moment. Because Lord, you have brought them here to hear your message and to hear your truth. Because Lord, they need to accept you into their heart. And Lord, I just pray for the soul who is listening and watching that has never confessed of their sins and invited you into their heart to make you their Lord and Savior. Lord, I just pray that right now in this moment, they would have the courage to say this prayer. And for those of you that do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, or you know that you have been backslidden and you have not been walking with the Lord, I want you to say this prayer. Just repeat after me and say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I've done some pretty sinful things in my past. And Lord, I want to confess those sins to you and ask and invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. And when you say that prayer, the moment you get done saying that prayer, the Holy Spirit now is going to come into your life and it's going to begin to guide you and give you peace and give you comfort. But from this day forward, you need to be living for the Lord. You need to be submitting and surrendering yourself to him and saying, Lord, what is it you would have me to do? Lord, I thank you for those this morning that said that prayer. Lord, I pray that today would be the beginning of a new day and an exciting life. Not exciting because you're going to make us rich or that you're going to make us famous or that you're going to make us super fast or super incredible, but Lord, an amazing life because we now get to live it with you. Lord, I thank you for making it so easy. I thank you for making yourself so available. And Lord, I thank you for dying on the cross in my place. Because as a sinner, Lord, I deserve punishment, but you took that punishment for me. And Lord, I just say thank you.
Secondly, Lord, you gave us time to serve you, to walk with you, to honor you, to praise you, to glorify you. And Lord, I pray that for everybody here who does know you, has a relationship with you, and has known you for years or decades, Lord, I pray that you would use each one of us to share you with others. Lord, to be bold and to not allow political correctness to quiet us or to keep us from shouting it from the rooftops what you've done and what you're doing. What a tremendous life it is to serve you, Lord. And I pray that it would be our desire and it would be the thing that we strive for, knowing that you will take care of the monetary needs, Lord. You take care of those that call you Lord. Lord, help us to make you our priority. Help us to use our work as our ministry. Help us to use our jobs as a ministry. And Lord, help us to be on fire for you. We ask you all these things, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Solomon discovered what's important. It's a relationship with Jesus. And I want to help to equip you guys to be bold. And that's why we have the Be Bold for Jesus conference. And that's why I want you all to come to the Be Bold for Jesus conference. It's happening on October 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. You can pre-register at tickets.beboldforjesus.org. Uh, tickets.beboldforjesus.org, October 22nd, 23rd, 24th in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So get your tickets, book your flights, book your hotel, and plan on being up here with us for those dates. It's going to be an incredible celebration as we sharpen iron sharpens iron, as we fellowship together, as we love on each other, and as the Lord equips us and prepares us to go back to our homes and be bolder than we've ever been before. So until next week, God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week. Let us know if you need prayer for anything. You can always call us uh, at our prayer line, 800. Uh, 800-461-0216. 800-461-0216. If there's anything you need prayer for, prayer for, please let us know. Until next time, God bless you guys. Have a great Palm Sunday. Happy Easter next week. And if we're still here, we'll see you then. God bless you guys. Goodbye, everybody.